Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the Talmud. Well, actually, Jewish learning, the opus of Jewish learning. Learning comes in many forms, and one is never too young or too old to learn, or to teach for that matter. Here's one of the best examples of teaching, of learning, of study. It was the amen heard round the world. 90,000 people saying amen in unison is an awe-inspiring event for everyone, for Jews and for non-Jews, religious or completely secular. 90,000 is a big number, and the event that brought it all together was not only heard around the world, it was seen around the world. Whether by streaming satellite or in front of uh, front page photos in the international news media, the world was privy to a life-altering experience. 90,000 Jews standing proud and celebrating Jewish learning. It's what we are all about as a Jewish community. We learn, we stand together, and we are proud. The word amen in and of itself is powerful. It's an exclamation more than a single two-syllable word. It does not simply mean, yay man, or I agree. That's how it's used in English, today's colloquial English at least. It's how it's used in non-Jewish prayer. But for Jews, it is a confirmation. It is the word that is uttered by those hearing another make a blessing. It is our way of participating in the blessings of others. The word itself is powerful. It has resonance. In fact, the Hebrew root, root of the word amen is the same root of the word emuna. Emuna is the foundation of concept of belief. Amen suggests that God heard the blessing that we, together with God, with that one word, agree in the, in the sanction, the blessing itself. It's a rough time for Jews in the tri-state area in New York. Uh, Jew hatred has been on the high, an all-time high. Attacks, both verbally and abusive, both physically and violent abuse, have become almost commonplace in many places. And yet, despite the obvious target presented by 90,000 obvious Jews gathered in one place, and despite the bone-chilling cold, blustery cold, men, mostly men, and also children and women, came out to celebrate Jewish learning. I was there. My voice joined with all those others at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, a short drive from Midtown Manhattan, the stadium that is home to the New York Giants football team. And we were all there to celebrate the 13th Worldwide Siyum Hashas. A Siyum is performed when one finishes the study of a portion of Torah or Mishnah or Gemara, uh, a.k.a. the Talmud. This Siyum was a celebration of the completion of 2,711 pages of Talmud. It was seven years and five months in the making. No breaks, no days off, no excuses. The process is as grueling as it is impressive. I speak from experience. I've completed the process twice. It's called the daf yomi, sometimes just the daf. One daf, two sides of folio page, every yom, every day. The concept of learning or studying the daf yomi was instituted in 1923 by Rabbi Meir Shapira from the Polish city of Zanik and later Lublin. Rabbi Shapira, a Hasidic rabbi, was creating a new cutting-edge yeshiva whose cornerstone was laid in May of 1924. He wanted his students to be fluid in both the world of Talmud and the secular world. Worried about the assimilation, Rabbi Shapira believed that Jews needed to be anchored in Jewish texts. He was convinced that with the Daf Yomi, Jews would be unified and connected wherever they lived and anywhere they traveled. Wherever a Daf Yomi participant went, he would be met by a clique of people studying the very same tractate on the very same page. It was the greater, great unifier for Jews who studied Torah and Talmud. And he was right. To this day, there is nothing more comforting than walking into an unfamiliar synagogue, sitting down among strangers, and knowing that those around you are learning the exact same tractate that you left behind before your voyage began. It's like traveling abroad and finding your favorite cereal or peanut butter or brand of shampoo in your local market. A story going around the world days after the Siyum Hashas tells of a local rabbi from New Jersey who was caught speeding on the, on the Palisades Highway by a New Jersey state trooper. After pulling the man over, the trooper glanced inside the car and saw a Gemara, a Talmud, lying on the seat. In a stern voice, the trooper asked, Have you learned your page yet today? Incredulous, the driver responded, No. The trooper said, Then go home safe and go study your page. 
And then the trooper explained that he was on duty at the MetLife Stadium for the Siyom Hashas. And that seeing all those Jews together, gathered together, fearlessly, peacefully, happily, singing and dancing and celebrating, learning, was for him awe-inspiring. Maybe it's true, perhaps it's allegorical, but without a doubt, the Siyom changed lives. And to that, once again, I say, Amen. And now, because it's still relevant and reverberating, and because it's also an educational message of its own sort, I'm also thinking of General Qasem Soleimani. The assassination or the targeting of the Iranian Al-Quds head, General Qasem Soleimani, continues to be big news. Politicians, talking heads, anyone who has an opinion on the subject is spouting off about why the assassination was right or wrong, if it was wise or unwise, posturing on the part of the United States, and if the situation will or will not cascade into an all-out war. In fact, there are just about as many theories out there as there of ramifications of killing Soleimani as there are variations in the spelling of his name. Israel and Israelis are justifiably worried. They are a convenient target for Iran, not only because the Jewish state is the biggest symbol of non-Arab, non-Islamic Western life in the region, but also because actions against Israel are the most effective rallying call and unifying tool for every other country in the entire Middle East. An attack against Israel is an attack on the United States. My best analysis is that Iran will respond on many different levels over time. Their opening salvo, was the 20 missiles shot at Iraqi bases that housed U.S. forces. Before making their move in advance of the missile launch, Iran warned the Iraqis of their intention. That strike was just window dressing. Over time, Iran will step back in terms of using its own armed forces. A full-scale frontal war between Iran and the United States is very doubtful. A direct strike from Iran and even from Iranian soil into Israel or U.S. bases is also unlikely. They will use their many devoted proxies to attack U.S. interests in the region. Iran will not engage directly with either the United States or Israel. Iranian leadership will follow that path, not only because it's expedient and absolves themselves of direct responsibility, but also because it is a way of honoring the memory of General Qasem Soleimani. The downed Ukrainian airliner that was botched, ill-advised attempt at hiding their real intentions. It backfired, but now they are back on track and will follow the blueprint laid out for them by the revered, now dead general. Using proxies, trained proxies, training them themselves, actually was the role of Soleimani. He was tasked with planning and execution of missions outside Iran, using their proxies to strike enemies of Iranian interests. He bolstered and trained the very groups and people who will now be called on to strike in his name, in his memory in defense of his country. Iran's most likely response will be calculated strikes by Hezbollah and by pro-Iranian militias in Syria and Iraq, all, of course, with the assistance of Iranian advisors and weapons. Their fingerprints will be all over the attacks. The world will know who perpetrated those attacks, but they will have plausible deniability. Israel, most certainly, will not be entirely forgotten. Israel will likely be on the receiving end of a barrage of rockets, maybe even drone attacks from across their northern border. But not from Gaza, not now at least. That's because as much as Iran would relish hitting or at least inconveniencing Israel from top to bottom of their country, Hamas is undisciplined right now. Gaza is a powder keg that even Iran will not be able to control. The important calculation vis-a-vis -vis Iranian proxies is which action will make the biggest statement. But action cannot be so large as to tilt the momentum so that Israel or the United States responds with even greater force. Israel's counter-response to Iran's proxy response to the United States assassination of Soleimani will be based on damage assessment. If missiles land in areas without significant damage, but still begin enough, uh, they're big enough, to make a PR splash in the Arabic and Persian press, escalated tensions will recede and revert to normal tensions. However, should there be any real damage, especially human life, Israel will be forced to respond by ratcheting up the tensions. The United States will probably use the same calculus in deciding on their own counter-response. That is the rhetoric of the president right now, President Trump, 
that which he's been using from the beginning. It is one of the points that he clearly made in his speech to the nation following Iran's attack on U.S. bases, the attack in which, thankfully, no U.S. personnel were injured. The person who would be most taken by surprise by the latest turn of events in the political, diplomatic, military game of tug of war between the United States and Iran is none other than General Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani thought that he was untouchable, tall and proud. He conducted himself in a way that would suggest that he had no fear of assassination. He would also be surprised, even shocked, that given his popularity, as was made perfectly obvious to all by the staggering number of people who participated in this funeral, that Iran would be satisfied by using only a few rockets to make their first move in revenge of his death. Add insult to injury, with rockets that caused little to no damage, Iranian leadership is well aware of that and of what they are doing, how they are doing it, and why they are doing what they are doing. That is why I am certain that there is more to come. It will not be direct hits. Iran's continued responses will be in the style of Soleimani. They will use Iranian proxies to attack U.S. interests and other Western interests who have interloped in the Middle East. For Iran, they are all infidels and all trespassing on Muslim land. Soleimani is dead, but Iranian regime remains. The Iranians have a plan. Coming up next, points of view. I want to discuss two columns today, one from the New York Times and one from the Wall Street Journal. Both have to do with anti-Semitism. This is a theme that I've discussed and will continue to investigate. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism is without a doubt the most important challenge that the Jewish community is currently confronting and will continue to confront into the foreseeable future. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. First up is a column from the New York Times, penned by Mitchell D. Silber. Silber is the head of the newly created Community Security Initiative, established by the Jewish Community Relations Council and the United Jewish Appeal Federation of New York. The column was published on January 2, 2020, in print, and December 31, 2019, online. Silber directed the New York Police Department's Intelligence Analysis Unit from 2007 to 2012. This is how Silber begins. I spent the past two years with the Guardian Group crisscrossing Europe from London to Kiev, assessing security threats to Jewish communities in Europe, which are facing a rise in anti-Semitism. Never did I ever expect my hometown to experience a similar spasm of anti-Semitic attacks, many of them violent, yet with 10 reported anti-Semitic incidents over the past week, plus the horrific attack in Jersey City in early December, we must confront this particular hate forcefully. The question is, what can be done to protect the Jews of greater New York? An effective multi-pronged response needs to involve the Jewish community in all of its diversity and the greater public as well as the city and state governments. Silber goes on to dispel some of the myths about the perpetrators, especially the idea that they're crazy or unstable or kids. What he writes here is very important in our understanding of the judicial process following these events. He writes, Data that I reviewed show approximately a third of the recent anti-Semitic attacks in New York are committed by people with histories of psychiatric problems. The arrest of such a person in a violent attack, hate crime or otherwise, might be considered evidence that he or she has a mental illness, which is likely to result in serious harm to self or others. Rather than being released immediately, those arrests should be formally evaluated to determine whether other intervention is necessary. To be sure, this doesn't excuse crimes of heinous anti-Semitism, but helps further combat a condition under which antisocial behavior like anti-Semitism thrives. Silver continues, explaining the need to have an effective plan and how to stop anti-Semitism. The data also show that almost two-thirds of the attacks in New York City are committed by juveniles who are local residents. This is deeply disturbing. After suspects are arrested, family court judges have too few options. City Hall must develop an age-appropriate restorative justice option for those adjudicated as juvenile offenders for their participation in what could be a hate crime. The program should include both supervised community service and an educational element that would focus on teaching an offender about societal costs of hate crimes. 
in addition to comprehensive anti-bias education programming, needs to be instituted in city schools beyond Mayor Bill de Blasio's current plan. Silber concludes, explaining that the Jewish community must protect itself and not simply rely on the police. He writes, Jewish institutions must continue to make themselves more resilient by improving access, control, and by making use of some of the recent New York State grant funding allocated for schools, community centers, and camps. State funding should include more robust protection for houses of worship. The menace of anti-Semitism won't be defeated overnight, but with a determined focus on deterrence, resolving mental health treatment deficiencies, creating juvenile rehabilitation programs, defending houses of worship and other Jewish institutions, we can begin to beat back the persistent violence that is afflicting New York's Jewish community. Well written. Good advice. Second up is a column from the Wall Street Journal, and it's written by Abigail Scher. Scher writes about her time as a law student at Yale and how her class related to an Orthodox classmate. It's hair-raising and truly insightful at the same time. It was published on January 3rd, 2020. This is how Cher begins. My entering class at Yale Law School in 2002 had one Jew who might be called ultra-Orthodox. He traveled some two hours to campus each Monday from Brooklyn, New York. And before the weekend, as far as I knew, he headed back on Fridays, when the Sabbath came in early, he needed to get home. He could be seen racing, white-faced, for the exit, one hand pinning a velvet armica to his head, the wheels of his tag-along briefcase crying out. Yale Law School was about the secular place that I had ever been, an institution where God seemed not only absent, but strangely irrelevant. I sympathized with his need to chase spiritual renewal somewhere else, but the open snickers of our classmates surprised me. They imitated how he raised his hand in class, palm a little too rigid and tilted slightly forward. They joked that it looked like a Nazi salute. They rolled their eyes whenever someone mentioned his name. Cher now describes how her Yale classmates made fun of this Jewishly identifiable person. No, she did not describe how she protected him or stood up in his defense. Just how he was made fun of. That aside, she writes, in an institution pledged to champion the downtrodden, contempt coalesced happily on his head. Most surprising to me was how readily and wordlessly our classmates seemed to have agreed on their target. How did they know whom to kick around? The defense of minorities stopped at his feet. So many unspoken rules of communication arranged themselves in a target on his back. Cher explains that this identifiable Jew did not fit into the Yale rubric and hence could be demeaned and made fun of. She tries to explain why they made fun of him. And this is what Martin Neimuller got wrong in his famous poem. We can all recite from memory. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Other people don't worry that they are next when the ultra-Orthodox Jews are beaten each week because there aren't. There is no practical, selfish impetus to protect these Jews. But there is a moral imperative. Because an America that allows its religious minorities to be harassed, assaulted, and murdered in the streets is not a free country at all. If religious liberty means anything today, then it must be something we afford those peaceful minorities whose political views have become unfashionable, whose customs appear to be throwbacks, who remind us more of another place and time where they were hunted and killed in unspeakable numbers. At stake isn't merely the lives of these Jews, but the soul of a nation that once welcomed and embraced them. This is a very powerful piece. Anti-Semitism is so blatant and so obvious in places where it should not ever be found. Yet, it is there alive and well, and once again, thriving. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you four cartoons today. They all deal with the US targeting Iranian general Qasem Soleimani. And the first is by Yaakov Kirshen, published on January 11, 2020. It's entitled, Ayatollah's secret weapon. The cartoon depicts the Supreme Leader of Iran saying, Trump might have the strongest army in the world, 
but I have a secret weapon, a Congress controlled by his Democratic Party enemies. This is a brilliant dig on the political attacks against Trump for targeting Soleimani. Remember, Kirshen lives in Israel, so he's watching this from 6,000 miles away and sees the Democrats' congressional attack against Trump's action as inane. Second up is a cartoon entitled Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. It was drawn by Monty Vorwerten and is from Battleground, Washington. The cartoon depicts the Ayatollah having just shot down the civilian airliner from Ukraine. He looks down and says, dang. The caption reads, when infallible religious political leaders make disastrous mistakes. This is a painfully poignant critique of Iran and their religious leadership, which is not answerable to anyone but themselves. Next up is a cartoon by Gary McCoy from Shiloh, Illinois. It's entitled, Iran Shoots Plane, and was published on January 12th, 2020. In the background, an Iranian shoots down the airliner and says, oops. In the foreground, an Iranian leader is appealing to Trump saying, it was an accident. Now, why don't you want us to have a nuclear weapon? This is hilarious. The obvious pun is on the accident. If they could shoot two missiles into a plane by mistake, what is the failsafe keeping their finger off the trigger of nukes? Finally, this cartoon is from the Netherlands. It's by Hajo de Regier and was published on January 14th, 2020. The artist depicts Iranian leaders as Pinocchio. His nose has grown very large from the constant lies. Actually, it's his nose that shot down the airliner. This is an, another wonderful critique of Iranian leadership and its handling of the shooting down of a civilian plane. There is no question that the Iranian leaders' denials and lies have become commonplace and a cornerstone of their foreign policy. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. There's another dramatic defection from Iran by a national hero. Kimia Alizadeh is the only Iranian to have won a medal in the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Her sport was Kai Kwan Do. Her medal was bronze, and now she's defected from Iran. In her Instagram post, Alizadeh wrote that she defected of her own volition, that she was not tricked or wooed into defecting, that no country offered her asylum or refuge. It is a chilling message that highlights what is now happening in Iran. She wrote, no one has invited me to Europe and I haven't been given a tempting offer, but I accept the pain and hardship of homesickness because I didn't want to be part of hypocrisy, lies, injustice, and flattery. Aliza Deck continues, I am one of millions of oppressed women in Iran whom they've been playing for years. I wore whatever they told me and repeated whatever they ordered. Every sentence they ordered, I repeated. And there's more. None of us matter for them. We are just tools. The young athlete is referring to herself and their sports colleagues. She is indicating that the Iranian regime uses them as propaganda tools for both the outside world and inside Iran. Aliza Deck concludes her message on the sad, sorrowful note. Should I start with hello, goodbye, or condolences? Hello, oppressed people of Iran. Goodbye, noble people of Iran. My condolences to you people who are always mourning. Camille Alizadeh is the second athlete to defect from Iran in the past few months. A male judo wrestler defected after he refused to throw a match to avoid the possibility of competing against an Israeli athlete. Iranian citizens, young and old, are bringing about change in Iran. They're standing up and taking a stance. At the recent cabinet meeting in Israel, the Prime Minister uh, on Sunday mornings, they always take classes on Sunday mornings, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu made an opening statement. In his statement, Bibi spoke about Iran. He explained, Iran lied. Do you remember the concept of lying? Just as she lied about nuclear deal, now she lies about the Ukrainian airliner. We have all witnessed Iranian denials and then witnessed the reversals and the changes they make. This time, they came clean, well, nearly clean, 
This time, the Iranians have acknowledged that, indeed, the Ukrainian airline was shot down by an Iranian missile fired by the elite Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Now, Iran asserts that the shooting was human error and unintentional. That part of the convention, uh, confession is highly unlikely. Anyone who knows anything about anti-aircraft systems knows that all anti-aircraft systems can distinguish between every kind of aircraft, if only by the pitch and speed of the engine's plane, the plane's engine. An F-15's engine is not like the engine of a civilian 737. It doesn't sound the same. It doesn't look the same. These are not blips on the radar, like from a 1950s television show. The Persian Muslims, just like other Arabs in the Middle East, they see all Westerners as outsiders and foreigners. They were all lumped into the same group, and they were all infidels. A Ukrainian airliner could have as easily been a U.S. airliner, or a British airliner, or a French airliner. They are all the same, interlopers and invaders treading on Muslim land, and most importantly, they do not belong. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that anti-Semitism is called the oldest hatred? Sometimes the longest hatred. There's a reason. Hatred of the Jew dates all the way back to the book of Genesis and the story of Esau and Jacob. The quote is from Genesis, and Esau hated Jacob. This is considered the very first example. And then comes the book of Exodus, which describes Pharaoh as wanting to destroy the Hebrews because otherwise they would take over the land. So Pharaoh instituted a plan to weaken and destroy the Israelites. And the entire book of the Bible, uh, the book of Esther, is dedicated to the hatred of the Jews and their being saved from an evil tyrant, Haman. Jew hatred has been around a long time and it is here surrounding and enveloping us today. It is our obligation to call it out and to combat it, not for ourselves or even for our children and grandchildren, but for the sake and future of the world. If we do not, if anti-Semitism becomes commonplace and acceptable, the world will be altered in an awful way. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.